Expressing traditional feminine traits. Okay. That people say equal opportunity, machine and gender bias. Okay. So what I'm hearing right now is actually what our research came, or my research came across. Um, so it says that more, like the more educated you are, the more you're exposed to um, different environments, the more you'll actually know what the definition of feminism is. But there's a huge misconception misconception out there that feminism is basically women being in control rather than seeking equality. And um, I'll just keep that there and we're going we're gonna to talk about this further in the presentation. Uh, next question is, why do some women identify as feminists and others don't? to uh, the entertainment uh, industry, and I'm going to be talking about, like, uh, Nicki Minaj in general, so, you know, she's good. I actually yeah. wanted to mention that maybe feminism has affected the entertainment industry by um, people such as Nicki Minaj or, yeah. like, Lady Gaga, just very ostentatious or over-the-top females in the entertainment industry. I feel like they, I feel like there's a more socially acceptable stage for them.
so it's really been a, 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 a big impact, I would say. Please. Do you have any tips on? They're like looking at Oh, no, I just said, no, I talked about it. All right, so, um, so the next question is going to be, how has feminism impacted the university education system? This is like a, I feel like there are more women entering the education system, and uh, I think that's something that's going to out last week is uh, how women are actually surpassing men in their performance as far as right. grades go. my section, but there, the increase in women has obviously uh, gone up, but uh, there was also, with the article that I read, there was also newer um, educational departments that have been uh, coming up over the last 50 to 60 years, and that's one of the major ones of the political movements that have come up uh, because of academics and women in the university education system is also something we'll talk about. Okay, so our next question is how, how has feminism impacted the STEM field? That's a really deep discussion question. The other girl is here. She's in robotics. Uh, yeah, she's yeah, Emily. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I'm going to add one more question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was going to add one more question just to see uh, for the woman out here. Um, who or identifies as a feminist. Feel free to like not answer if you want, but I mean, okay. <laughs> <Just> no? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to move on and hand it to Damon, and he's going to go over a little history, maybe that'll. A little hard to see, but um, I'll go over it. So the actual definition of feminism by Merriam Web Webster defines it as a theory of political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. Um, so if you if you really take a deeper look into it, if you guys want to imagine that we all live in a world where men dream of becoming the leaders of the nation, uh, men are always they're sick and tired of women. Uh, making more money for doing the same exact job. They're constantly having to tell women uh, that they're not interested. They're constantly having to uh, steer away from sexual assault, uh, behavioral assault, and then they are perceived as being weak in the entire world. Now imagine this, instead of you take the male and you place it with the female, that's actually the world we live in today. So if, if you close your eyes and you think about it for a second, if, especially from a male perspective, you, you get to see like, wow, that would be a little crazy. Like, say we're trying to elect our first male president instead of our first female president. But uh, this is a picture um, this is by J. Howard Miller from 1943. It was for Westing, Westinghouse Electric. It was inspiration for World War II. It was, um, it was basically saying this uh, women can also play a part in the war. They need to go out and work. And it uh, goes hand in hand with my next slide because or actually, if you could go back one time. If you read the top, it is, we've all taken history classes, and um, I just read this online, and I thought it was really neat. It's history and not, go to the next slide. <laughs> Her story. <laughs> but, so this, um, so this is the feminist movement. It is uh, three waves. The first wave, um, right around the time that we can do a picture as well, is uh, 19th and early 20th century. It's mostly focus on uh, voting rights, and it's mostly in North America and the United Kingdom. Then we go on to the second wave, uh, that's around the 1960s, so a little mid-20th uh, mid century. That's, uh, it began in the US, and then it spread to Europe, it eventually made its way to Asia, and in this one, it's more about equality and discrimination. It's about uh, sexuality, reproduction rights, wage gaps, and then, um, and then how women are getting those liberal rights. And then the third wave, which uh, some sources I looked at defined it as the last wave, and then some had a fourth wave that I'll talk about. The third wave is basically started up in the 1990s, and it's still going on, and it's 
um, to go after the second wave being perceived as kind of a failure. The third wave takes in a deeper look into race, ethnicity, um, culture, religion, and nationality, and how that affects feminism. The fourth wave, that's not on that pictogram, um, would be uh, basically the social media stage. It would be just everybody coming together. So now we'll take a deeper look into feminism as a contemporary to women, how feminism affects education, feminism in Hollywood, feminism in careers, and feminism at the entertainment business. Okay, so um, I'm gonna focus on a research that was conducted by uh, Swarsky and Angelone in 2016. And um, they came up with an article as well, it's called The Quality, Empowerment, and Choice. Uh, this research was based on three theories that women's decisions of identifying as, as feminists or not is based on education, influence, awareness of inequality, and discrimination. So um, I know we talked about this a little bit in the discussion, but uh, what we mean by education is that younger women are more exposed to education and more exposed to uh, the information that makes them realize what their rights are and what um, what their rights or freedom and uh, how they should be equal to men as well. Um, influence, this includes uh, social influence, like social media in particular, that's like a huge part of it. Um, and also influence uh, from like caregivers and like their mothers, that, that's, that could be a huge influence as like why someone would identify as feminist or not. Um, and awareness of inequality and discrimination. So this is a huge point because um, in the article it mentions that it's more likely for women to identify as a feminist, especially if they have uh, been discriminated against or have been in a situation where they felt like they're unequal, which only makes sense because make, it makes them want to like stand out and like stand for other people. Um, this is not based on like being an activist, it's just, just identifying as feminist or not. Um, moving on to the next slide. So I know this is a lot to, to take in, but it's actually three columns, that's how we could uh, put them into the slide. Um, so this research was based on different uh, uh, different uh, variables. The first one is age, religion, um, so age, religion, U.S. region, ethnicity, and occupation. Uh, so it's based on women in the U.S. Uh, in particular. Um, so if you can, if you take a closer look, uh, women between ages of 18 and 25 have identified as feminists more than the others. Um, women with no religion also identified more than others. Women with, or in the Northeast region identified as uh, feminists. Um, women that are white or Caucasian are more likely to identify as feminists. Occupation is healthcare education. And then women that are students more than caregivers are more likely to identify as feminists. Um, so, just as we can see, these are like really important variables uh, to consider, especially when it comes to the occupation part, um, because it supports their theory in the first place, which says that uh, education is one of the things that helps uh, women identify as feminists or not, um, as well as the age is a huge variable because younger people are more likely to identify as feminists as well, um, and also students. Okay. So just a little detail about what the study consisted of. So it's uh, 494 women in the US only. So 347 of these women identified as feminists and then 97 did not identify as feminists and only 50 did not, like they, they thought it's not, um, they're uncertain about their feminist identity. Um, so what they ended up doing is the survey consisted of yes or no questions as to if they identify as feminists or not and then um, reasons why they would, um, and then they took these questions and sort of like came up with seven themes to come up with um, like what, why women are more likely to identify as feminists, and the strongest reason is because they have the general desire to, uh, for gender equality. Um, and so, so I'm gonna hand it over to Raj to talk about feminism and like education. Yeah, so, uh, we already talked about a little bit of this where, you know, we saw that uh, there was an increase in uh, the demographics between uh, uh, women and from the last few decades. But the part that we haven't touched on yet is 
the educational background. So several years ago, history and political science were really um, studied on. But uh, right when feminism uh, and the activist movements came in, there was a whole other uh, branch of studies that came in, which were women's studies, African studies, LGBTQ studies. But um, there are a lot more than just those three studies as well. Um, the article that I studied on whether feminism and higher education in the current crisis, um, it studied, it goes beyond just those three um, academic uh, uh, majors. Um, I'm not sure which of these UTG offers, but you know, those are pretty cool studies now. And then uh, there was also an increase in the number of students also, but that's that goes beyond just women and men, because there was a whole new branch of studies that were opened up over the last few years. There was a whole new um, interest for students as well. So uh, there was uh, an increase in the number of students from lower income families to come in. And because of this, uh, more and more scholarships have also been offered uh, throughout that time. Go to the next slide. So another um, article that I read was basically a memoir, uh, and it was a personal experience. Um, and Damon kind of touched on this a little bit. Uh, but this goes more into a, a personal level uh, for this woman, where she describes her own personal experience uh, for the different um, waves of movements. So one of them was uh, during her time as a, a social worker, and as she got her PhD. And when she was a social worker, she, in order to even get that job, she had to um, get the recommendation of uh, another uh, male uh, co uh, colleague, but he wouldn't get that for her. And so she had to do it herself and do it. And then she goes on to tell about her PhD. But once she gets done with her PhD, she also talks about um, how it was very difficult for her to rank up and uh, be someone with who can supervise uh, another section of uh, professors, basically. And this also showed that like there were barriers for her as a female uh, when it came to uh, employment and stuff. So that's a cool article. So I'll move on to Alex. So a big part of the, of the entertainment of the entertainment industry is Hollywood, and Me Too movement was a big part of the feminist movement. Uh, it began in 2017. That's when it was brought to light, but it was actually created in 2006 by Turner Burke, who used it in the community to help the women talk, bring in meetings and talk about what's happening in their lives, like harassment or anything. And when it was brought to light in 2017, it was by Alyssa Mohando who tweeted a story about her sexual assault. And it brought in like 30,000 interviews and women talking to, talking to her and responding to her about their situations and what they're going through. Uh, it was made possible by brave women and men who also became, and also because of social media and big influence. And you know that as well. Some of the advantages by, in the article by Gibson, it says that it gives courage to women to speak up and share, it stops men in power from abusing that power against women and providing consequences. Uh, it created awareness about sexual assault and violence and it helped reveal that the legal and systematic provisions in place to deal with sexual harassment have failed. And disadvantages, uh, Leanne Atwater did a survey and it said that men and women are less likely to hire attractive women. Actually, 10% of women and men are less likely to hire attractive women. And it also said that men become overly cautious with fear of being falsely accused. And one third of men would be reluctant <laughs> having a one on one meeting with a woman. And the movement is unregulated, which means that anyone can accuse anyone of anything without any evidence or proof. And I'm going to hand it off to you and talk about that. So let me thank them for you. So as of now, there's a huge gap in gender. Uh, there's a gender gap in the STEM field. And you could argue maybe men are just better at math than women. But I believe that's not the case. Because if you look at high school statistics, men and women in STEM field were actually exploring relatively the same level. So that doesn't seem to be the case. So what I believe is more of a societal construct of us not encouraging women to be in the STEM field, rather saying, oh, this person's just a mad person. Well, I believe that may be true. I feel like a certain part of it could be just this mindset that we have of what's, what I am and what this person is. Like, essentially stereotyping 
And there is like high risk of mistreatment for women in the men-dominant areas that do make it in there. I believe the statistic was 41% more women in a men-dominant area are likely to have received some sort of harassment, which is astonishing high compared to the men, which is only 3%. And gender stereotyping as well in the women. So essentially, like the women aren't destined as competent as the men in the STEM-based field, and they're essentially stereotyped for just being a woman. And there's no real encouragement in the high school for women to like go towards these STEM fields, essentially. Even though they're scoring the same as like men in the STEM-based uh, subjects. So, so some solution for the gender gap, I believe, could be a program. Program to encourage them. The article I read actually showcased that there was an increase in women joining STEM majors if they joined the clubs that encouraged them. Like I know at UTD we have a women's technology, I believe. And in there, they had like clubs in high school, which encouraged like for women specifically to join the STEM field, and that did show an increase and bridge the gap between the gender gaps. And avoiding stereotypes for individual majors, like I do believe, it's like oh, this person could be a math person, this could be this type of person, but I guess don't fall to pray for it as much as you would think so. And I guess be more vocal about this in general because this type of issue isn't really, I believe, brought to light as much as it should have with this giant statistical gap that's happening. And But some of the limitations could be that these programs are effective, but as of now, they aren't as effective as we would like to be. And the workplace is still predominantly male, so there's no real way, I guess, these programs could help them out. So I believe the only real thing we can do as of now is just be more vocal about this whole issue in general. She's a multi-million dollar woman that's reached the top. One of the few black women who have actually reached uh, a multi-million dollar like industry, uh, two million dollar like net worth, uh, with the exception of uh, Missy Elliott, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, one of the few ways that people have seen her using uh, feminism is through her career and through her body. So, through her career, she uh, reels in an audience through feminism, and then. Um, People see it, society sees it, some, some society sees it as a way of like uh, misinterpreting women in, in the form of like rap videos that you have probably seen. But um, the way Nicki Minaj uses it as is, uh, she's actually sending feministic messages first by garnering like male gaze to inform them of what feminism is to her. So she, like through her music video like Anaconda, she's uh, showing like self empowerment and self like confidence and self independence and like female independence in, in her body and the way that she portrays it. So that's one way of, uh, uh, that Nicki Minaj shows uh, uh, feminism to herself. And that's, that's her way of self-expression. And self-expression is really important because uh, it's important to feminism because once the choices are objectified, there's a marginalization of what normal is based on what actions are taken. So when I say that there's a mar marginalization of the way that she self-expresses herself through her music videos, it's um, basically pushing the boundaries of what society has made normal for feminism. So when she's uh, able to express herself the way she wants, and like having an all-female cast of Anaconda, she's showing that, yeah, um, the females do have a part in the, in the rap game as well. And also, later on moving, uh, a few years ago, like there was also like in, uh, in the MTV Awards, um, black women getting accolades. Although she does recognize herself as a female uh, first, she's also a black woman. And in the music industry, it's really hard sometimes to not get recognized. Sometimes black women are put second. So it's really important for her uh, to be recognized. And in the MTV Awards uh, 2015, uh, she was actually, uh, she had more records and sales than uh, Taylor Swift, but there was a huge uproar and Twitter drama that was going on uh, over uh, whether uh, black women are being uh, recognized in the music industry. So today, women perceive feminism as a social movement to empower themselves and also vocalize society's most discriminating aspects. And as uh, Alex mentioned earlier, it's also led to activist movements like the Me Too movement, 
So there's that quick e-learning survey for team seven. And then our final team eight is Spiral of Silence. And maybe you can think about why people don't identify as feminists. I know, no one raised their hand. I raised my hand.